Once again this morning for our gospel reading, we are in the gospel of St. John, chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Miracle stories draw different reactions from different people. Because they elicit wonder, they occupy a prominent place in children's Sunday school curriculum. They can prompt others who have lost hope or cling to a fading faith aware of suffering and powerlessness. Miracle stories make others skeptical, questioning how much of the story stems from legends, superstitions, or ignorance about how the world really works. Sometimes miracle stories worry us, or at least me, making me wonder why the Christianity we practice today is so bland compared to back in the day when the sick were healed and the dead were raised. I've got a hunch that church attendance would be dramatically increased if pastors started healing the sick and raising the dead every Sunday morning on schedule precisely at 8 o'clock. Of course, Jesus performed many miracles in the gospel. People certainly regarded him as a wonder worker. No one, not even his opponents, ever accused him of being a charlatan, someone who faked miracles to get attention. Even his enemies recognized some kind of power in him. Sometimes they questioned its source. Did it come from God or did it come from Satan? So maybe things weren't better back then. It's a little boring here today, but at least no one is getting crucified. 
Things are a little different, however, when it comes to Jesus' followers who are the one performing miracles. Whenever Jesus' followers perform miracles, the first thing they do is to make it clear that it's Jesus or the Holy Spirit who is the source of that power. Peter's healing of a paralyzed man and his raising of a woman, woman from the dead were not his first efforts in the miracle working department. But this time it's different. This time it's special. This time those who are healed are treated as more than objects. This time we know their names. You see, Peter doesn't heal, just heal a paralyzed man. He heals Aeneas. While the dead woman from Joppa is called Tabitha, others call her Dorcas. She has two names, one Aramaic, one Greek, suggesting that she may have been multicultural, connecting people across their differences just like the gospel in which she has a share. Aeneas has known suffering. For eight years he has been bedridden. But that's about all we know about Aeneas. We learn much more about Tabitha and Aeneas' story quickly gets passed over, mostly as an introduction to hers. She is a disciple. She is one of the clan. Her discipleship is exemplary. Her generosity makes her a leader within her community. Among her other deeds, she made clothing for widows, people who we can presume were poor. No wonder those widows, women who were already acquainted with death and loss and grief, summoned Peter to Joppa. They wanted to do something to comfort or help them and their community. Or maybe there they or maybe they dare to hope he might do something for her. Can this wonder-working apostle do the impossible? Can he raise the dead and restore life to this community in need? Well, Peter can, and Peter does. Or more accurately, Jesus does. Acts is careful to avoid giving the impression that Peter wields his power on his own. Remember what he said to Ananias? Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And Peter prays in Jesus' name before commanding Tabitha to rise. You see, Peter does not replace Jesus. Peter is a channel through which Jesus' ministry continues. The work of the church, described in the book of Acts, is not a new thing. It's a continuation. Jesus continues to be active in the world through his followers, through their deeds, through the word proclaimed, through our participation in God's salvation. And through it all, Jesus remains present. And then through the church, the church and its prominent members do not replace Jesus, 
They do not stand on par with Jesus. Peter and Paul may suffer hardship, be arrested, and finally find themselves on trial before the authorities, but the book of Acts tells us nothing about their deaths. Others can do the things they do. They are not irreplaceable. It's only Jesus who dies, rises, ascends, and spends, sends a spirit that is irreplaceable. As Peter says about Jesus back in chapter 4, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we can be saved. The restoration of Aeneas and Tabitha garner a lot of attention. But no one follows Peter or joins a church because of it. Instead, we are told that many put their faith in the Lord. The power working in Peter is from Jesus and returns back to Jesus, bringing others into the fold. The miracles Peter performs are not ends in themselves. They provide a means of bearing witness to Jesus as a new expression of the ministry Jesus began after his baptism. Yes, these miracles accomplish much, Aeneas certainly benefited in terms of health and finances, freed from his paralysis. And the widows of Joppa rejoiced in the return of their friend and benefactor. Tabitha may well have been pleased as well. But those gains were temporary. Aeneas, I suspect, grew old and frail. And Tabitha died again, as did the widow and the other disciples she served. Even Peter, such a conduit of Jesus' power, cannot fix all the world's troubles. Acts has a chair of high-profile figures like Peter and Paul who sometimes tempt us to believe that authentic discipleship must be a high-wire act, always involving danger and deliverance, public recognition and miraculous deeds. But these characters easily distract us, even unsettle us, if we think their experience is the norm. And then Tabitha steps into the spotlight. In just seven short verses, we get a peek into her life, and we see how vital she is to those who are around her. Here is a disciple just as exemplary, just as necessary to the well-being of her community. The beauty of Tabitha and her service is how attainable it is. Good works, charity, clothing, giving to the needy, hardly superhuman deeds. Still, these activities can have miraculous outcomes, generating widespread love, support, and appreciation. Through Peter and Paul and the public deeds they perform, we have the structure of Acts. And yet Tabitha is as much of a disciple, is as much of a witness as they are. 
in her commitment to others, she leads the community. In her mercy, we see God. With her two names, we imagine the bridge she built between two different kinds of people. Something Peter has yet to learn as he discovers new dimensions of the gospel's reach. And so today, we take time to celebrate Tabitha. Today we take time to celebrate those ordinary saints like her for their service to others and for the way they manifest God's concern and God's charity. Thanks be to God. Amen.